Hey guys, it's Claire, and you're listening to exclusive interviews with Define. My company is called Define MMM, and that stands for Mind, Mission, and Marketing. And that's exactly what we're here to talk about with former clients, title holders, and friends. Today, we're talking to Ashley Thompson, Miss Oklahoma 2018. Ashley is a graduate of the University of Oklahoma with a bachelor's in women's and gender studies. Throughout her year of service, she advocated for her social impact initiative, Human Trafficking, the Exploitation Epidemic. Ashley started in the teen program, competed for almost 10 years, and made the top 15 at Miss America 2019. Yeah, nine years, and then with my years, Miss Oklahoma, 10. Yeah, so a decade of your life dedicated to an organization. Uh, Give us a little bit about how you got started, why you kept going. So I got started because I grew up with my grandma and her friends, and one of her friends always told me, someday you can be Miss Oklahoma. You can be Miss Oklahoma. She was a local director for the organization, and at that time, I just thought about it as this little girl's childhood dream, like, yeah, I get to be Miss Oklahoma, wear the pretty sash and crown, and so I started competing in an outstanding teen competition in 2009. I competed for three years. I made the top 10 two of my three years, and then it was time for me to be a Miss, so I thought, okay, I'm just going to start this local season off and see how it goes. Well, I actually won my first local pageant, which was Miss Oklahoma City, and Vicki, the woman who told me my entire life she thought I would be Miss Oklahoma, ended up being my director that year. So that was kind of the first full circle moment in all of this. And I actually went to Miss Oklahoma that year. I was completely tragic, did a tap dance that Shay Sullivan choreographed, but somehow this cape that we designed came in weighing 25 pounds. I also had mono at Miss Oklahoma that year. So needless to say, did nothing my rookie year. Then I went back the year after and made the top 10, went back for two more years after that, didn't make the top 10, went back the year after that, made the top 10, then went back the next year and won. But I think the reason why I kept coming back, even though so many people always said, okay, seriously, you're not even making the top five, why are you doing this? Is because I always knew deep down that one day I would be Miss Oklahoma. And for me, it just came down to timing and it was, perfect how it worked out because me being Miss Oklahoma any other year wouldn't have been good for me or really the organization. I feel like because I was so old when I won, because I had competed in the system for nine years, I understood and I appreciated it and I knew what I wanted to do as Miss Oklahoma and I did it. So, uh, for a while you had one platform and then you evolved and, and changed as you got older and, and chose to take something on that um, was a bit more difficult to take on. You took on a platform about human trafficking. Uh, so tell me about that decision to change a platform or a social impact initiative as we're calling it these days. Tell me about the decision to change um, and the kind of the risks that came along with that and why those risks brought reward. Right, so when I first started as a teen, I started with a community service platform called Just One to Get Things Done, which transformed into a platform called Building Better Lives Through Teamwork. So it was always about promoting community service. I loved community service. But as I got older and I was in college, I actually went to the University of Oklahoma as a microbiology major was a microbiology major for my first three and a half years. And during my last year of college, I saw some of my friends in the organization going to law school. And I thought, okay, it's, I don't want to be a microbiology major anymore. I feel like I can serve people outside of the medical field. And I feel like I could do that with the law. So I actually changed my major from microbiology to women's and gender studies. And it was when I became a women's and gender studies major and I was working on my senior capstone. It was a 72 page research thesis and I researched the pipeline framework of drug abuse, human trafficking and female incarceration in the state of Oklahoma because we have the highest rate of female incarceration of anywhere in the world. And I thought, what's causing this? What, what's the end all be all here? And I figured out it's human trafficking. So after doing that research thesis, the program I was in, had us all start doing an internship. So that's when I started interning with an organization called No Boundaries International. 
which believe it or not, my parents had owned a business just around the corner from it. Actually, my great grandpa had started it. So they had had a business there for about 60 years that was just around the corner from an organization that was serving not only the homeless population in Oklahoma City, but also women and children who were victims of human trafficking. So I started volunteering there and I'll never forget my first day there, a woman came in and she was going to pick up her third grader from school and she had these sunglasses on and when she came in, she pulled one of the workers aside and they let me come with them. And when she took her sunglasses off, her eye was, she had been brutally beaten and she said, I just need some makeup so I can go pick up my kid from school. And that's, that's the moment when it really hit me. I thought, these are real women, these are real children, these are their stories, and this is something we need to start talking about in Oklahoma because it's a lot closer to home than anyone realizes. So I had just changed my major, made a huge life transition, and I went to my local director and I said, I think I really wanna talk about human trafficking. And it was actually at the same time I started working with you. And I remember all three of us sitting there brainstorming for a while and thinking, okay, nobody's ever talked about sex trafficking and pimps before. So we have to find a way to do this. And that's what I did. I called them a pimp on this Oklahoma stage. And later the judges were like, did that girl really say pimp in her onstage question? And they were like, well, I mean, what else do you call them? That's what they are. But it was so crazy because as we got deeper into developing my social impact initiative and as I continued my internship, not just as an intern, but as a volunteer with No Boundaries International, a few months before I competed for Miss Oklahoma, I was actually targeted by a human trafficking ring on my college campus. And that, that's when I knew that as Miss Oklahoma, we always wondered, how do you talk to kindergartners about this? How do you talk to first graders about this? How do you talk to those different populations of kids and even teenagers? You don't want to scare them, but you also want to make them aware. So I think it came down to just being brutally honest and explaining from stranger danger all the way to, listen, people are targeting you for sex crimes on Instagram. So it was just a really cool experience. It brought a lot of risks with it. But I think what I did and what my director and what you helped me do with it was make sure that this worked. I mean, I remember going into a ton of schools as Miss Evan Liberty Fest and talking about digital safety, talking about stranger danger, talking about saying no to drugs and alcohol. And it was that gateway. So when questions in the interview room came up about like, how do you talk to a group of kindergartners like this? Oh, I already have. And that was, that was the real difference for me using a really risky platform that not a lot of people are comfortable talking about anyways, but doing that trial and error before I competed for the job that I really wanted. I think that's why I was so comfortable with taking something so risky because to me, it wasn't a risk. That was the everyday life I was living, serving this community. And I knew that their voices needed to be heard and I could be that voice for them. I love what you said about, you know, do the trial and error essentially while you're a local title holder, and then you'll be prepared no matter what comes up in the interview and it won't be as scary. I think a lot of people um, think that when they walk into an interview, they have no idea what's coming. How do you know what's coming in your interview and how did you prepare for that? There is always that fear of the unknown. And even as a law school student now, I experience that every day. It's basically like one giant three-year interview. But I think you just have to go in there knowing yourself better. These judges, they don't know you. They know you from a piece of paper, but you have to know yourself. And that is one thing that I had always struggled with my first few years competing. I don't think it's that I didn't know myself and I wasn't in tune, but I just don't think I had the maturity yet. I don't think I was there emotionally to really start figuring out who I was as a person and who I wanted to be long after my pageant days were gone because that year originally, that's before the age change happened. And that was supposed to be my last year of competing. So I had to figure out not only who I wanted to be as a state title holder, but who I wanted to be the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And it was that year that I was preparing too, that I was always so nervous. I hated mock interviews. I hated the thought of even doing interview. I mean, I was always good at it because I liked to talk to people and I knew the right answers to the questions, 
but I never let them in really personally and what was going on in my life and the relationship to everything. So I think that fear of the unknown, you just have to know yourself better than anybody else. You have to have those five or six things about you that you're confident in and that separate you from everyone else. Not to make you better than everyone else, but that just separate you and things that you really strongly believe in. So I think going into that last year, I was not at all nervous when I walked into the interview room. I had my ponytail in, my blue dress on, and I was ready to go because I knew myself finally and I knew what I wanted and I knew that these judges better pick me because I was ready to be Miss Oklahoma right then. But if they didn't, that was okay because I was about to go do something just as big, if not bigger than Miss Oklahoma. Going into Miss Oklahoma, you have a now pretty infamous line in your closing about my time is now. I know it's been something that we said to each other just over and over and over and still kind of do. Uh, we said it both when we got engaged around the same <laughs> within the last year or so. Um, so what gave you the confidence to walk into the interview your last year after competing for nine years and say my time is now and have confidence that it truly was? I think I eventually just had to break down. I, for so many years, saw myself taking on the role of Miss Oklahoma, and I have a really interesting story because my best friend my entire life, she ended up being Miss Oklahoma in 2012, Alicia Clifton, and then my college palm coach, Taylor Treat, was also Miss Oklahoma. One of my local directors, Emily West, was Miss Oklahoma. I had a close relationship with Kelsey Cartwright and Kelsey Griswold. I had this relationship with Sarah Klein, and... Finally, every year I competed, they always believed that I could be Miss Oklahoma, but sometimes I felt like I was trying to be who they were when they won. And so I finally had to sit down and tell myself, listen, you're never going to be all of any of them, but a little piece of them is right there with you. So I think when I finally figured out that I had to be my own Miss Oklahoma and see myself in that role, and I figured that I wanted to be the Miss Oklahoma that would leave the legacy of really being intentional and reaching out to people throughout my reign, just because all of those women have impacted this organization and especially our organization, Miss Oklahoma, in so many different ways. And still to this day, they're so iconic for the things that they represent. So I knew that I wanted to be the one who was super intentional and genuine. And it's funny because when I actually decided that that would be what I wanted to be as Miss Oklahoma, when I walked in the interview room, my first question was, we've asked so many of the girls here, if they didn't win Miss Oklahoma, who would you want to win? And they had said my name. And I was shocked because I never thought that would be my first question at Miss Oklahoma. It's like, why do so many people think that you should win if it's not them. And that's when I realized it was because I was intentional with those people. So sometimes when you're trying to figure out who you want to be as a title holder and you're genuinely living that life, you never know how it can help you in the interview room too. I think that's awesome. And you're bringing back all the memories, giving all the, all the feels. Uh, I can even tell like it, it is still, you know, a, a touching and emotional thing for you to reflect on who these women are in the organization, what their legacies are. And do you ever have to pinch yourself to realize that you're now one of those people? Oh, all the time. I mean, I sit here daily and people will say something at school and be like, oh yeah, I'm Miss Oklahoma. And I'm like, yeah, that was like a lifetime ago. But then when you really get to start thinking about it, I mean, just these women and how they've even impacted me. I was competing in the moot court competition for our 1L year a few weeks ago, and they were all having a conference call on Zoom while I was competing, and they just kept sending me these texts like, good luck, you've got this, this is like an interview, you've got this. And it was just so cool to think, okay, these, these people have always been in my corner, but now they're really in my corner, and you're stuck for life. So that's why I always tell girls, Never be mean or catty when you're competing with these people because I competed for six years. So that means five people won in those years that I didn't. And it took every single one of those girls to win because I needed them in my life too. It was just as important for them to win as it was for me because I needed them throughout my year. I couldn't have gotten through it without 
all of their support and advice because being a state title holder, it's, it, you think it's going to be one way and then it's just a whirlwind of experiences and situations and you're sitting there thinking, okay, what do I wear to this? What do I say at this? Am I doing this right? There's no way to gauge how you're doing. So those are the people that help you gauge it. For sure. For sure. Um, you've mentioned law school a couple times. So you are now a law student. Um, just in a practical sense, what is something that you took from your preparation in Miss Oklahoma and Miss America and have applied it to law school? Always being organized and being on your feet, being ready to stand firm in what you believe and who you are as a person. Because in law school, we don't have grades throughout the semester and our grade is based on one final exam. So that means that every day we come to class, the teachers use the Socratic method of cold calling. So that means you have to have everything read before you come to class and the professor at any point could call your name and say, Ms. Thompson, what did you think about this case? Can you brief us on this case? And you have to be able to sit there and stand firm in what you believe and what you want to say and if it weren't for the Miss Oklahoma organization and the Miss America organization, I don't know that I would have been able to walk into the law school classroom every day and feel comfortable because it's an uncomfortable situation anyways. But at least at the end of the day, I know that I can say something that will make logical sense and be able to get through my day of law school. And if you're not cold called, those are the best days of your whole life. But <laughs> I think in a practical sense, it's just taught me to, really stay up on everything, whether that be current events or that be just what you're doing day to day and to really stay organized. I know I'm a naturally organized person, but the job of Miss Oklahoma also made me super organized. Um, now, having gone through one full year of law school, um, what would you go back and, and reverse and reply, apply to your Miss America prep? Looking back on it now, I think one of the things I personally struggle with is being patient. I always want to know the outcome of something. I wanted to know the outcome of was I going to be Miss Oklahoma. I wanted to know the outcome of was I going to make the top 15 in Miss America. I wanted to know the outcome of will I make it through my first semester of law school. <laughs> and so I think one of the things I would change about my entire kind of adult journey is really just enjoying the journey rather than trying to make things happen all the time. I'm a really goal-oriented and task-oriented person, so I like seeing and achieving those short-term goals, but sometimes I think it causes me to lose out on the bigger picture, and in my bigger picture, everything always ends up okay. There might be some struggles along the way, but it's hard for me to see that everything is going to be okay. So I think I would take that back to when I was preparing for Miss Oklahoma and Miss America because I was just so nervous and now is when I look back on those moments and I'm like yeah I remember being in the studio practicing with Shay in New York I remember what it felt like when I finally looked at you and said like I have to win Miss Oklahoma and not for me but for all of these people who poured into me and for what I can do with the job so I think just letting myself be more vulnerable through the process because I don't like to let myself do that, but I should. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were some serious breakthroughs where you just saw those walls come down and you've always been an incredibly warm person and a very, very genuine person. But I think sometimes people mix up that that does not mean that you're without walls. Um, and it just means that there's some, some personal privacy around you, but I think that your personal privacy came from something you talked about earlier, knowing the right things to say, but not giving a hundred percent of what you were genuinely feeling in that moment. Still kind of thinking there about what's the right thing to say in this situation. And you're such an analytical and intelligent person that you knew how to outsmart the organic conversation in a way. And so that was right. a matter of trying to get it back to its organic conversation. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, you needed to, to win Miss Oklahoma for all the people who had poured into you. I think for anyone who's competed for a long time, um, and has had special relationships with their local directors, 
all of the support can also feel like a lot of pressure because you're not just doing this and having your own reputation on the line, but in a way you have their reputation on your shoulders. So how did you handle that pressure and what advice might you give to someone who is experiencing something similar? Right. So the year I won Miss Oklahoma, I had a local director who I had had before, actually, as Miss Bethany Diane Edmonds was my director. And then again, as Miss Edmund Liberty Fest. And I remember that it was two years before I was Miss Edmund Liberty Fest that I was her girl. And one day she looked at me and she said, you can be Miss Oklahoma. And I was like, Diane, no, I just want to go and make the top 10. Like, and she seriously looked at me and said, no, you can be Miss Oklahoma. And I think a lot of the time she believed that more than I did. Um, probably even leading up to the moment I won Miss Oklahoma, she believed and knew and had this faith that it was going to happen for me. But I think you just have to remember that at the end of the day, these people are going to love you and respect you and cherish you, whether you win the title of Miss whatever or not. And that took me some time to figure out because I was working so hard week to week, not only because I wanted to win, but because I knew that she believed that I could win. A lot of people believed that I could win. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, I've never even made the top five. How are you so sure that I'm going to win? But I think if you do everything in your power to get yourself to not only where they want you to be, but where you want to be. I'm somebody who I'm willing to put in the work. If somebody thinks I'm capable of something, I'll do it. I'll work just as hard as they're willing to work with me. And fortunately for me, my local director, she did everything with me. We would run together 10 miles a day. She never made me do it by myself. Even when I met with you, we would have conversations about our meetings afterwards. So I never felt alone in the journey. But sometimes I understand for people that that gets to be a little bit too much. But for me, I enjoyed it so much that she's actually a bridesmaid in my wedding. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, it's so great because I think we, we do hear about people saying, you know, look around at Miss America. These are going to be the bridesmaids in your wedding. But you, do, you have a lot of special people in your wedding and they're from all parts of the Miss America organization. And I think it's such a testament, yes, to this organization, but to you and to the, the open heartedness and the intentionality that you talked about. If, you, if you're willing to put yourself out there and um, make these relationships with, with other women, it's there for you. And you have to have the humility to be able to befriend people who are competing against you and who you technically are competing against. But I think um, once you've been through it, you realize at the end of the day, you're not so much competing against those other people. You're competing against no. yourself and your own um, capability and, and possibility. And then at the end of the day, it's up to the subjective opinion of five to seven strangers who meet you for a total of 14 minutes of your life, which yeah, is mind boggling to be like, why do we compete in this organization when it's, uh, when it's that tough? But I think at the end of the day, it's because you see how much you get out of it, um, which is incredible. Let's, let's do this. Let's do one piece of very tactical advice. So like a specific thing that you did to prepare for Miss Oklahoma that you think other people could borrow. And then maybe a second piece of advice that's a little bit more about just the, the emotional, mental, <laughs> kind of ethereal, intangible about preparing for Miss Oklahoma. So I think what my one piece of tactical advice would be something that I learned from you. And I am not one that likes to write things down at all. I know where this it. is going. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely hate it. But <laughs> one of the last times I was in New York, maybe not one of the last times, there were a lot of times. <laughs> um, but you said, I really think you need to start writing this all down. And so I remember I was in the airport by myself you know, working on that independence that I wanted to work on that entire year. Mm -hmm. And I bought a journal and I still have that journal. It sits by my bedside table. And I started journaling out every single thing I wanted to remember about my journey to Miss Oklahoma, but the main pillars of what makes me, me. 
And I remember before interview that year, instead of taking my resume and my platform, you should know your resume and your platform. That's a small piece of you. But I took that notebook with me because that's who I really was. That's who I really am every day outside of those 14 minutes that the judges get to meet me. So that is what I wanted them to know. So I would suggest writing things down <laughs> in a notebook, the best advice Claire ever gave me. Well, and it's so much, I think, I think people take a lot of notes during interview prep, but like we write down the, the strategies or the tactics or the examples, but the real thing is write down how you feel. And if you're having a breakdown, write that down. If you have a breakthrough, write that down. You'll um, probably experience both at the same time. <laughs> exactly. That always happens at the same time. But even um, now, I go back because, I mean, I struggled emotionally throughout my first year of law school, but I would go back to that notebook and look at the core of who I am and think, okay, you can't be shaken by law school because look at how strong you are. Look at how far mm -hmm. you've come from what you've written in these pages. Look at all of the things that you have made happen. And I think even now, two years removed from being a competitor, I look at that and it still gives me better advice than I could give myself rationally in any situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I know you're not just saying that for show, but I know you've done that because you usually take a picture of it and text it to me and it say, Holy cow, like I'm just going back to this place and remembering um, how, how you got there. And, hello, pup. Um, <laughs> just how you got there and, and the strength that you have. And that's something I always want to focus on is innate strengths. And, and that's where so much prep is not so much about developing those strengths, but identifying them and recognizing them in yourself. Right. Because I don't even know that I mean, you do have to develop them to a point, but it's so crazy to think that most of the strengths I had were things that I had all along. I just didn't recognize them as strengths. They were things I took for granted. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that probably wraps into your overall emotional, mental well-being preparation <laughs> advice, but anything separate? Well, I would say everybody, and I do say this because I know it is so kind of corny because I had like that whole motto of my time is now. And I mean, I remember writing MT, I in, in every shoe I had that I was competing in, even the one that broke while I was on stage. And had things in your opening, number, yeah, that was That's, yeah, epic. That, that is always, always a memory. Um, but I think if you have that kind of motto, that mantra for yourself competing, it makes you so secure in knowing what you want to represent that week. So for me, knowing that my time is now, it wasn't just my time is now to be Miss Oklahoma. It was remembering, Ashley, if you win Miss Oklahoma, that's great. If you don't win Miss Oklahoma, that's great. Your time is still now. And it's carried me through some of the easiest days of my life, some of the hardest days of my life, but it's always served as that constant reminder of remember that you have this time and use it to the best of your abilities and take advantage of it. I love it. I think we should all think of exactly what our life motto is. And, and that's something I love about the Miss America organization is that it focuses us in a way like there isn't, there aren't many other things in this world that challenge you to identify what your motto is in order to keep you going. And so I love that this is kind of a, um, a preparation that guides us to figure out those things. Right. It helps you figure out who you are because who would have ever thought that when I decided to take on that risky platform and at the time I hadn't even applied for law school, I applied you know, while I was competing for Miss Oklahoma and was taking the LSAT in the middle of preparing for all of oh, yeah. that. And I, I, just, I just remember being like, okay, well, at least everything I'm doing for law school is setting me up for Miss Oklahoma. And I just didn't, now looking back on it retrospectively, I realized how much you can say till you're blue in the face while you're competing, oh, the Miss America organization has done so much for me. But if you think of all those things it's done for you, then I can tell you that two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you're going to look back on it and realize even more 
of what it's done for your life because it really put me on the path of knowing, okay, I have what I want to do with the rest of my life and that's help victims of human trafficking. And now I have the vehicle to go and do it. I had a year's worth of experience that then took me into law school and then will take me into my career as an attorney in Oklahoma. Thanks for listening. I'm Claire Buffy and this is Define. Get more information at define-mmm.com. Have a good one.